the next uh, the next uh, talk is from Alex Moss and Carolyn Shelby. They are, let me read their bios. Carolyn Shelby brings her extensive SEO experience and strategic insights into integrating cutting edge SEO practices with business goals. Alex Moss complements the duo with his deep understanding of technical SEO and his expertise in making complex concepts accessible to a broad audience. The topic, uh, future-proofing your SEO, updates, overviews, and leaks, uh, will dissect the latest revelations from the Google documentation leak and explore the implications of the forthcoming AI overviews rollout. You can learn how these developments can influence your SEO strategies and how you can leverage WordPress to stay ahead in a rapidly evolving digital landscape. Let's bring them in. Hello, Carolyn and Alex. How are you this morning, afternoon, wherever you are in the world? This morning, where are you at? Afternoon for me. I think it's, it's 4 p.m. for me. And it's ah, actually getting... one of the five nice days of the year in the UK. So that's an actual background then. That is not that's a fake a real, background. That's a real life background. <laughs> you didn't have to fake the sunshine today in the UK. That's wonderful. <laughs> so happy to hear it. Well, I want to thank you both for being here today. I'm excited to hear what you have to say, and I'm just going to go ahead, turn things over to you, take myself out of it. I will put your your slides up on. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Today, Ready? I am. Okay. So this is Future Proofing Your SEO, Updates, Overviews, and Leaks. I am Carolyn Shelby. And I'm Alex Moss and we are both principal SEOs at Yoast, um, which is obviously part of the new full digital family, uh, which um, includes all. Includes all of these uh, great brands. Let's get started. Uh, first of all, let's kick it off with insights from the Google leak. So tell us more about the Google leak, Carolyn. So um, what happened? Um, if you have been living under a rock, you probably heard about the Google leak. What happened was uh, in early May, there was a massive leak of what was originally billed as being the algorithm. Turned out not to be the algorithm. It was API documentation, which I'm sure a lot of you are developers, you know, is not the same as actual algorithm mathematics and details, but it was, I, I believe it was in a publicly accessible uh, GitHub kind of repository that somebody found, uh, made copies of, and then disseminated. The leak included more than uh, 2,500 modules and 14,000 attributes, which was, you know, basically it's the building blocks of what they're crawling and indexing and then storing so that they can assemble and uh, assemble algorithms, uh, do tests, all kinds of things that they that they use to do the rankings, but not necessarily what they're using right now to use the rankings. Some of the documentation appeared to be contrary to what they've long maintained, which is what, which is that they don't use uh, click through rates, they don't have a site wide authority score. There were there were building blocks in this repository that made it look like that was perhaps not a hundred percent accurate. So the, um, some of the other yeah, bits, does... oh, go ahead. Yeah. So, well, I would say, what does that, what does that, what's important in that data? So it was all released. So there are a few things to point out. So the first thing is that it didn't tell you any weight of any variable that would go into what's a ranking factor or a signal or anything like that. But what it did tell you is what it was recording or potentially considering. Um, one of them is click data. And that's one of the things that they kind of implied that they weren't looking into. Um, and something called NavBoost, which if you don't know what it is, this is ChatGPT's definition. So Google ranking algorithm that improves the relevance of search results for navigation queries. And by analyzing user interactions such as clicks, hovers, and scrolls, it emphasizes the importance of user-friendly website navigation and positive user experience for higher search rankings. So that in a nutshell means that user interaction is really important. The way people actually go through a website and their journey through it is now something they take into account as what makes a useful, helpful, and engaging website. 
Um, so that was one of the main things that we should be considering when we're doing things in a development or a design-led world, as well as an SEO world. Um, the other thing is site authority, which is kind of obvious, and it's been there around the whole time. There's always been domain authority or some other acronyms by third parties, but it does indeed measure what an overall good site is and what is good can be a number of different things. One of them is content freshness. So frequently updating content is something that they advise, but not to do it, obviously, in an abusive way. If something changes, and the good thing is, is that you can use, say, WordPress um, walkthroughs, for example, will change over time. So it's good to keep that updated and actually align that with what WordPress is up to so that your content is more relevant and therefore gets more um, eyes on the search engine crawlers um, looking at your site. Um, the last thing is to look at entity mentions. And by entity, I'm an entity as a person, as a professional, and I work for Yoast, which is a brand, which is another entity. Um, I can connect myself under the hood through schema and other structured data to do those things. Having that um, as the basis for, as well as your content, is um, one of the many things that they do look at. Um, and it's really interesting to know that they are looking at it and considering it. Sorry, I clicked too early. <laughs> the implications of all of this for SEO, I mean, obviously with the with the freshness factor, long gone are the days when we can just put in a variable that will automatically update the day every day and go, oh, look, it's fresh, because that doesn't work anymore. But we do know that the tracked elements that are not directly part of the algorithm might be contributing or mitigating factors that are calculating things that are part of the algorithm. So something that they're tracking over here that they're like, oh no, that's not a ranking factor. Not a ranking factor means not actually part of the algorithm. Doesn't mean that it's not part of some equation or math that they're doing over here to get this component that is then part of the algorithm. So technically they're not lying. I mean, in spirit, they're not lying either. It's just, you have to be careful about how you interpret some of their answers. But based on all of this, we know that the SEO strategies going forward definitely need to include a focus on user engagement, content freshness and refreshing, making sure that things are relevant and up to date. Do work on your brand authority. So getting those backlinks, getting um, you know, advertising, just brand awareness, general brand building activities are important. You're not going to be able to be this no-name brand sitting in your mom's basement competing with the big guys anymore. You actually have to make an effort to be a thing, not just sales. Um, and then comprehensive link building efforts. These are all going to be part of your going forward strategy for SEO. So moving on to the next section, we've got preparing for AI overviews. Yeah, so AI overviews, I'm not sure if anyone in the audience is experiencing it because it's mostly in the US, but that this is now taking over our traditional 10 link cert. It's pulling in information from websites, bringing it into what we call a zero click scenario where that, that searcher will get the answer without having to click into a website or do anything. They can get what they want from the search result. And that's actually becoming a bit of an issue because the test that they've done and the releases that they've made, say in May, when they started doing the AI overviews, when it about what 85% of the search, they were really mm -hmm. testing the information that it gave out, but it was spitting out nonsense and in some cases dangerous information, um, which I'm not even gonna repeat now, but that actually led to an, a decrease in the overview itself of you know the exposure it had on SERP. So let's just take the US, because I know they've been testing in the UK, but I'm in the UK and I haven't seen it at all. So they're not testing on me particularly. But what's interesting to know is that they've gone down from 85%. And two weeks ago, when we were doing a practice run of this talk, it was 15%. And since our practice run, um, about a week ago, we've now seen new studies from Bright Edge show that it's gone down to seven. So they're pulling it back, but what they're not going to do is get rid of it. Um, they're going to bring it back again um, once they do more user testing, more market research, and of course, better AI integration. But what does that kind of mean? The first thing it means is that the real estate gets what I believe is more valuable. So some might say SEO is dead. You won't be able to optimize a page or a site because what's the point if it isn't 
embedded into the answer of AI, even for zero click. And the answer is, is if you don't optimize your site, then you won't even be there for that zero click. You won't be mentioned at any point. You won't get any exposure or visibility in an organic manner. The only way you're going to be able to do things successfully is through paid, which is an avenue, but it's not the only avenue that anyone should take. You do still need to, to make sure that you're optimizing, though, because if you want your message to be part of the narrative that, that Google's creating or the AI is creating as far as the summary, if your message isn't out there, how can it be part of the summary? So if there's if if there's a point of view or a perspective or 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 valuable data that you want to see reflected in what the AI is telling people, you have to make sure that you're communicating that in a way that it's going to get incorporated into those, those knowledge bases. The AI overview, if you haven't seen it yet, so if you're outside of the United States, it's, it's entirely possible that you haven't. This is what it looks like. So I did a search for our male calico cats always sterile. And I did this only because I, I was pretty sure this was going to trigger uh, an overview. And it did. So yay me. Hmm. It seems to rely heavily on the intent of the user. So are they, are they looking to buy something or are they just looking for information? And in this case, I was looking for information. I wanted an answer. Then did, did it answer the question, the content that they were pulling in? They, you could see they got information from Wikipedia. They got information from a newspaper. They got information from probably an environmental type site, says Tree Hugger. And then what's the authority of those domains? Wikipedia, obviously hugely authoritative. A newspaper, probably also pretty high on the, on the authority factor. Not sure about Tree Hugger, but clearly in position three, it's lower in, in authority compared to the other two. Yeah, and it's also interesting to see what, when we talk about intent, um, it might be useful for the audience here to know that I won't go into the four different types of intent, but there are four different types of search intent. Do search on Google for Yoast, um, Yoast search intent. We've got a nice blog that explains everything, what the four are, what they all mean. Um, but one thing to note is that sometimes at the moment, at least, um, AI can't take perception of what something is. So you'll still have to do some sort of intent yourself. Um, I was actually at another conference yesterday um, and someone used the example of over the rainbow and the search was, is that happy or a sad song? And currently ChatGPT doesn't actually provide a definitive answer because there, there is none, right? But it doesn't, doesn't sway either way, but AI overviews are starting to understand that actually you can pull out user-generated content. So there was another example when it used AIO, it brought in an opinion from Quora and it used a human one, even though there was an AI produced one by Quora itself, which didn't provide the answer of whether it was happy or sad. So using that alone in a shopping environment, for example, you have different intents at different purposes and you should be able to create the most helpful content based on that intent and also mix the intent. So we see that AIO is bringing a lot of informational intent. So mix that up with transactional or commercial. Yeah, I could see definitely taking the opportunities to, I generally shy away from editorial commentary, but if you're in a shopping environment and you can get people to, to say things like, these are the best fitting shoes, these are the most comfortable shoes, you know, get reviews on the page in text that that are contributing those editorial comments so that you can help color that um, you know those summaries. So when someone does say, what's going to be the best shoe for walking around Europe this summer, they can say, oh, well, you know, I did see on this one website that these are the best shoes and they'll recommend those then. Um, these are very similar to direct answers. I don't know if you guys have seen direct answers before. I'm sure you have. These were like the original zero click um, Product. A little bit. Oh, you did? A little bit in your, but not, not too much. Oh, you don't get them too much? A, li a little. Them. We, we got them a lot uh, in the U.S. They're, um, you know, and they've been doing them for a, a, several years, but they weren't AI generated. So they, it was actually taking a, it was finding an answer it liked. It was taking the answer it liked directly off of the page and then repurposing it. With AI now, it's taking more information from more pages, 
summarizing it, understanding it, and then spitting out an answer. So rather than one site getting the credit for that direct answer, here you've got three or more sites getting, getting credit for providing the information that the AI is using. So it's, I don't know if that makes it better or worse than, um, than direct answers. It, it certainly, I think, provides more opportunity to get into it, which is all the more reason that you should be aware of it and considering it as you move forward. As you're moving forward to prepare for these AI overviews, you need to make sure that your content is well-structured. Well-structured meaning you've got correct and proper HTML. You're not doing anything weird with your HTML. I know with direct answers, there was people would, the number, okay, quick example. The, the site that was ranked number one for how to change your tire had step-by-step -step instructions and the instructions were listed in uh, definition, definition term, and then uh, definition, I forget what it was. It was definition term and definition, the DD thing. And then they had a video in between every step. What got used as a direct answer was a site that ranked number eight, but its steps were sequential in an ordered list. So having that ordered list and conveying to the, the engines that this is this is a sequence of events that needs to happen in this order, and we're not going to interrupt or break that list, helped take that, that one site from position eight, which was well below the fold, to the, the answer that pushed the number one result down the page. So it is important to have correctly structured HTML. It's, it's important to have good schema. Making sure that your content is relevant and engaging is always going to be important. The schema markup is going to help you optimize for the natural language processing because when people talk to the AI, they're talking in much more natural language. That we're we're getting away from, you know, one search term, maybe a couple modifiers. Now they're saying, "Why would I?" or "How can I?" or "What do you think is the best?" People are using a lot more natural language. Making sure your content is helpful, providing answers that are easy to find in relationship to the question is also important. This is not a situation where you want the question to be at the top of the page and then tell your life story before you get to the answer. You want the question and the answer to be kind of close to each other so that it's obvious that there was a question asked and you're providing that answer or rephrase the question in the form of an answer. I don't know if they still teach that in school, but that was really high on the priority list when I was like in fourth grade. Um, and finally, you want to make sure that you're building your subject matter authority and expertise following the EEAT recommendations, because they are looking at, are you a subject matter expert on this particular question? Why would I take the, why would I answer a question about the sterility of male cats if you're a bookseller? Yeah, you might have read that in a book, but, you know, cats really aren't your expertise, are they? It's books. So I think I'm going to go to a, a veterinary clinic site or someone who's a geneticist that specializes in orange cats. You know, it, it's make sure that Google thinks that you're the expert on that topic. But the uh, folks who don't know maybe what EAT stands for, um, it, it stands for experience, expertise, authority, and trustworthiness. I think experience was the additional E that they added a few months after making E80. Um, this is in a nutshell what it perceives as what be would be a good, it perceives what could be a good ranking factor if it even declared that it was a ranking factor at all. It didn't say, they say that it's not a ranking factor and people say that it's not, but then Google also say how important personas are, per personal profiles, um, first um, first party knowledge, all of that kind of stuff. The EAC, I believe, is a very important thing. But on a structural level, it should also define the way in which your site is structured and how you how you perceive your audience from your site. So with that, I mean, you need to prove that you are an authority and you are to be trusted and you are to be cited and therefore an authority to be ranked. And these are the four main things that they look at. So when you provide content, whether it's, I don't know, um, your own personal brand, your own personal website, or if you're talking about a specific topic on WordPress, even now, if I said block themes, you may have a couple of people in your head who are 
EAT on that specific subject. I would like to think that if someone thinks of WordPress and SEO in the same sentence, we may be in that list as well. So outing that onto the web and making sure not only do you get all that right and structured data, but within the content itself, that's actually helpful to the user is a good sign for Google to look at your site. Um, and hopefully that explains more, but there's a lots of EAT posts out there that explain each and every aspect of what each letter is for. Um, but next, I, uh, I think we're going to talk about HCU and core updates, aren't we? Yes, we are. I don't know how many of you were around in, in the early, early days, but the Google updates used to be not terribly frequent. We might get one or two, you know, two at most a year. And they were so big, they were named like storms, right? So we, in 2011, we had Panda and 2012, Venice. 2012, uh, 2012, we also saw Penguin. The pirate update didn't really, that wasn't as big as, as Penguin. Penguin, Hummingbird, and mm -hmm. Pigeon, I remember, were particularly obnoxious. Eh, not obnoxious, obnoxious. Pain, painful. They were painful. They were obnoxious because they interfered with my life, but they were, they were, they were pretty big shifts in the, in, you know, disturbances in the force, let's say. Huge shifts and, at the time. Mm -hmm. Huge shifts at the time. At the time, yeah. The if you look though, you know, 2014, 2015, they were just maybe nine months apart. So sometimes you'd get one, sometimes you'd get two. But then we got up to 2021, and then they started coming more frequently. We had two in 2021 that were big. We had the first two HCU updates in 2022, and then in 2023, we had what three big ones and now they're coming every month yeah and these one were very impactful so i would say the hcu um the ones that that are on the slides now number three and four in september 23 and uh, the second one in both well, the fourth one technically um in march this year were the biggest impacts and it was quite a weird time for a lot of publishers because september saw quite a lot of sites fall off a cliff visibility wise and they were doing some people were doing things actively to try and rectify the situation others were just waiting and doing the odd thing and hoping that the next update which was in march would help matters and let people recover that wasn't the case um for some it was the last nail in the coffin um and it actually made things even worse just despite some people thinking that if they did all the changes by the time they did it when the next update happened, it would be fine. But this tweet um, was from um, a search engine roundtable post where it was basically an ex in, um, interaction between uh, Dan Hart and um, search liaison, which is Danny Sullivan. And he was basically saying that um, classifiers are enhanced now and they update all the time. So to you and me, what that means is if you do something good the day after an H, the, any update essentially and there's a negative effect and you do work on it in the next week it's not like you have to wait five months and it's not like you have to do that work in four months time so that you're in time for the update in five months it's one of those things where it's constantly updating so the sooner that you try and make as much of a valiant effort to rectify your site the quicker you can maybe recover from a helpful contents update however it is it is worth noting, I still haven't seen a recovery story from HCU, um, but it is also worth noting that Danny Sullivan or John Muller, I don't know who it was, who said that there's another update coming, which probably they just, means in the next they just six started weeks. one. Yeah, I know, I know one just started like the other day. I think part of the problem with people getting all excited about not actually excited, but believing that the next update would would resurrect them from the from the grave because they made all the the fixes. You don't actually know what you're supposed to fix, so you're you're punished for something, but you don't have you don't have an exact roadmap for what's broken and what needs to be fixed. Everyone's still guessing because it's not like Google's telling us this is exactly what we looked at and this is this is why you fell short. They're they're hiding that from us. So everyone is, is struggling and floundering to guess and hope that they guessed right. And it doesn't seem like anyone that was hit particularly badly has guessed correctly yet. No. 
and it didn't help either when there were a lot of interactions on X where Danny Sullivan, bless him, was trying to explain as much as possible without giving away the secret source. But every time he he answered a question, he in effect opened up three more questions to three more scenarios, and he ended up in a web of engagement. He had to stop because there is no there is no scaled scenario in this example, um, and it's obviously had the biggest impact over all this time. Um, however, this is what they've been kind of implying to people, haven't they? Um, they've been basically saying, make sure that the content is of top quality and is extremely helpful to the user. Um, but then again, people would say, what is your perception of helpful? To me, it's providing the best answer to the relevant query that someone puts in as quickly as possible without distracting them from things such as advertisements or too many advertisements, bad UX or navigation. So that's the kind of, without being too specific, the implication on if you have a bad site in terms of navigation, the way you can even go through categories, taxonomies, the way you can, not just the navigation at the top, but the way that one can journey through a website. If that's bad, then it may be looked at badly. That may be one thing. Scaled content is terrible. Um, so doing things templated, letting people go on autopilot is the worst thing possible, really. And that can really have a massive massive impact and it kind of did because there were a lot of people who messed around with AI content and I remember them showing off on social platforms and then nine months later they're not they're not talking about the continued and incremental success of that experiment are they not at all the I think part of the problem though is they really want original content and there are so many like I I don't even know that I could count the number of websites that we're legitimately making a decent living generating not original content. They were basically repackaging and rephrasing things that had already existed. So they're not doing any of their own research. They're just kind of aggregating this other content, putting it in their own voice and then publishing it. I mean, that's, that's great. But if you're not a brand and you're not really going to, and you're not putting any effort into adding value to that information that's already out in the public domain, what is the value of what you're offering? There, there's no exactly. value. Exactly. I mean, again, for the audience, the best example that has been specific to Google are voucher sites. So we'll have all know that if we've looked for any voucher, you'll be given lots and lots of different kind of sites, sites that might even be surprising. Coupon, Coupon, Coupon. sites. Sorry, sorry. I say voucher, don't say in the UK. Very different. So coupon sites. And that's been hammered down. And that's part of a scaled content um, example, right, of, of what you shouldn't be doing. And that is that was web spam. In my opinion, it was web spam. There's a coupon on one side. I don't need to see the same 20 on the same on different sites. And it was used to help essentially become a gateway to domain authority. And that's why it was used. So they've kind of taken that way, which I believe is a good step forward. Um, so that's just one example of spam and scale of content that, that shouldn't be done. Um, and that, that probably leads us to the next slide, Carolyn, um, that, that leads us to the spam updates, which have kind of been concurrent with all the core updates as well, and as frequent. Yeah, the scaled content abuse, which I'm glad that they got to, they expanded the spam policies to include, so the scaled content production is like the AI People were using AI for that. People were using content mills for that. So it really doesn't matter if it was automated with AI, automated with machine learning, or effectively automated with content mills that were being written by people. The they were they believed that that's intended to manipulate the search rankings, which to be fair, it is, and they're getting rid of it. Anytime that they look and see that you're churning out insane, like inhuman quantities of content quickly and with little to no added value, they're going to come down and you like the, the fiery fist of God. They're also coming down on expired domain abuse. To be fair, I believe expired domain abuse was, I think there, there have always been things that they've done to, to quell that, but I don't know that, um, I think they've just ratcheted that up. Expired domain abuse, I mean, sure, I'm sure you guys know what that is. You find a domain that used to rank really well, you buy it, and then you redirect it to your site and then reap the rewards, right? 
And then site right. reputation abuse. This was actually kind of a big deal for, for me because I come from a news background. Sites that have high reputation would rent out subdomains uh, or rent out you know, pages on their site for insane quantities of money. This was literally like keeping newspapers afloat so that places like coupon sites or business listing sites or sites that, that do affiliate links could rank really, really well because they're, you know, coupons.newyorktimes.com or something like that. Um, and, you know, Google's always kind of frowned on that, but now they've, they're, they frown on it so much that all of these newspapers had to no index and cut off those parasite sites because it was going to start getting the main site penalized, which would have been, you know, death for yeah. those, those big sites. So all in all, I think that was that was a good a good thing. So this yeah. brings us to our implications for SEO, which is kind of our, our wrap up session here. Um, effectively, what we you know to maintain a strong search presence, you have to make sure that you're creating user centric content, you're leveraging your expertise and authority, you're not scaling content in in, in an inhuman or, or abnormal kind of way. And then make sure you're doing regular site audits, address your low quality content, improve the user experience and ensure the information is current and relevant. Which is good, just good intentions, right? For any Absolutely. site optimization. So yeah, it's just like, be honest, be good and be helpful. So the common threads throughout all of this, we you know what, what we've learned, user engagement, still very important, probably more important than we thought it was originally, Prioritize metrics that enhance your user engagement because when it what it all boils down to is Google wants us to be giving a good user experience for the users. And if it's not a good user experience, it's not going to be rewarded. Content freshness and quality, keep that content updated, add value. Don't just regurgitate things that other people have already said. If you're not adding value, it's not good content. Build that authority and expertise. Make sure that you're building your brand. You're showing off that you're an expert. And I don't want to say stay in your lane, but you kind of need to stay in your lane. You can't be an expert on everything. Show Google that you're an expert in your thing, right? Technical optimization, also super important. Make sure that you've got your site speed up to date. Your mobile optimization is very important, especially now that uh, I think it was July 4th or 5th. Google officially switched over to mobile first indexing, which means they're not sending the non-mobile crawler out to look at sites. They're only sending the mobile crawler out. If your site does not work perfectly in mobile, you're going to have problems. So do make sure that you're doing that. Add your schema markup, and then make sure that you're keeping aware of the changes to the algorithms and the changes to the, you know, the rules and regulations so that you stay in compliance this will help you maintain a strong search presence. Yeah, so how do we apply the knowledge? So keeping up to date, I mean, you can join us once a month on the uh, SEO update by Yoast, that's one thing, but uh, using tools um, and plugins within WordPress sites. I mean, not to blow our own trumpet, but Yoast does a pretty good job of solving some of these issues. Um, not all of them, because some you'll have to extend either your free um, products or even premium by using things like schema API, if you're really doing a heavy hitting site, but there are tools out there to optimize, to make things faster, to make things more mobile friendly. If they're not you kind of should be in the first place anyway, um, for accessibility purposes, but there's lots of stuff out there and, um, it's very good to, but make sure you do your own research, right? You don't just want to get any old plugin and ensure that the authors have EEAT, right? Um, and yeah, and from another point of view, um, technical tweaks, focus on the site speed, use, use page speed insights, use things like site kit, see how the performance of your website's doing and looking even outside of plugins of index now and site kit, go into search console and Bing webmaster tools, um, and check all of them out and see what the state of the site is. Um, and I don't need, I need to, uh, mention too much cause I know there's quite a few WordPress devs in here who are great at what they do to maintain clean organized structure, not just in the back end, but in the front end of a site as well, uh, because not doing that can be a huge mess. Absolutely. 
So the actionable tips would like you to take away, be consistent and strategic with your internal linking practices. Make sure that you're linking within your body copy to other things on your site so that you're, you're moving people around and you've got good, good anchor text associated with that content. The bad backlink profiles really only apply when you're linking out from external websites in. Internally, you can be as aggressive with that keyword optimization as you like, and you're encouraged to do so. Don't skip your fundamentals like optimizing page titles and descriptions. Use high quality images, but make sure that they're reasonable file sizes and don't forget to compress them to get, you know, squeeze that extra bit out. And then make regularly monitor your performance to make data driven adjustments to stay ahead of those SEO changes.